Good morning, everybody. It's the next webinar about naming classes and objects in object-oriented programming. It's based on an article I published a few months ago on a blog, which is called Don't Create Objects That End With ER. So let's discuss what's wrong with this ER suffix and uh, what's the best way, what's the better way to, uh, to give names to the classes and objects. Uh, the main point which I will try to, to express and try to convince you is that all the names which are, uh, which are derived from, uh, from a verb and then this ER suffix is wrong. For example, manage, the, the verb is manage and then the manager is a class name. Control is the verb and then controller is a class name. Help is the verb and helper is a class name. There are many examples of that, which you, I'm sure you have in, in your code and you, you, you've seen it in other code. So it's like writer, reader, quite common concept in Java, converter, validator, dispatcher, listener, sorter, encoder, decoder. All of these names, that's my point, all of these names are wrong. So we should not name our classes like that. We should not combine then the verb and then the ER suffix together to give the name of the class. And I'm not say, I'm not going to say that that this is that this is not the best approach. That there are, this is approach which you can use. I'm saying that you should never use these names. It's not like I'm suggesting that these names are not as good as others. I'm just saying that these names, this type of naming classes, is just wrong at all. So just stay away from that. And the main reason is that, uh, like the article explains, and then I'm trying to, I'll try to show the examples, is that when the name is built like that, it usually means that this is not really a class and this is not really an object-oriented programming, but instead it's a collection of procedures, or maybe just one <clears throat> procedure, and it's not a class, it's just a, it's just a, a wrapper, a bag, a shell, for a number of procedures, which is wrong, which I'm strongly against it. So I'm going to compare the imperative or uh, procedural approach to object-oriented and declarative approach. So on, when, when the class is named, for example, loader, that's what I'm going to talk about today, the loader, uh, to load the content of the file, then if the class name is loader, it means that this is not a class. It's just a, a wrapper, just, just a, a a wrap around the procedure which loads this file, which is wrong, which is not what object-oriented programming is about. Instead, we should call it differently, I'll show how, we should call it differently to stay in object-oriented paradigm and in a declarative programming style. So let me, let me share an example first. Uh, I made some small uh, diagram for it to demonstrate that, so here we go. So this is, uh, this is a, well, I, I probably, it's better to show the class first. Uh, give me a second. Stop sharing this. I'll share, I'll, share, I'll share the code first. So here's the code. Let's say I want to, I want to make, I want to load the content of a file. I'm, I'm pretty sure you understand what this code does. So it's a loader, which is a class, and uh, it encapsulates the path of the file. And then I call the method, which is called load, and it goes to the disk system, to the, to the file system. It opens the file, it reads the content, it converts it from bytes to string, and it returns it back in, in Unicode format. So the loader, it looks like it looks like a class, but in reality, it, you understand what it does. It's just, it's just it, it knows where the file is, because of the encapsulated uh, path um, parameter. And then there's a function which is called load, which actually tells the class what to do and directs it into, like, it's, it's, it's a procedure which loads the file. So here's the, uh, so what I'm saying now is that, is that, let me now stop and show you the, the picture you've seen before, this one. So here's the client. The client is who is actually calling this. The blue, the blue rectangle is the loader, is the class I just showed you, I just demonstrated you. So this loader is actually, it encapsulates this, it encapsulates the path 
that encapsulates the location of the file. It knows where, where the disk system is. It, know where, it knows where to get the actual the content of a file. And then the client, which is, uh, which is my code, which is using this loader, is actually the client is trying to, it's, it's calling this method load, and which is called, which is the method, and this load is actually going, going to the disk and loads the file. So here's how I call it, new loader, so I create like an instance of this file, and then I, I, I say dot load, and, and the content goes from, from the disk. My point here is that in this case, the loader is not actually, is actually a connector, is actually a, a, a mediator, between the, the client and the disk file system. So it just accepts the request for loading the file, and then it goes to the disk and, and gets the content and returns back the request. So it is, it is just a connector, a mediator between two resources, between two actually active working instances, the client and the disk. It's not really an object, because it doesn't have any, uh, it doesn't actually represent the disk file system. It is just a it is just a, a procedure which is called load, which in case of if Java or any other language would allow us, we would just put it here, because we don't really need this blue rectangle. We just add the pass over here, and that would be just a load, just a procedure, which can be called like this, and then this procedure will just go to the disk file system and does and do the work. So we actually don't need this blue rectangle because all we needed is just to wrap this procedure and let us call this procedure. So by using this, by calling it a loader and calling this method a load, we actually, we, we tell ourselves, we encourage ourselves to understand this not as a real object, but actually as a place for the procedure. So load is just is like in C, for example. In C, that would be a perfect procedure, which we, which we would call load file, and then give the parameter, and then give the like the, the location of where to store it, and then we just call it, and that would be just just isolated location of a piece of code, which is called a procedure. In our case, we do, we do not have actually the object. The object doesn't really exist. The object doesn't really mean anything for us. We basically, like I said in the article, we basically don't pay respect to this object, so we don't. We don't treat it as a as a as a self-sufficient living organism or like living creature or like self, you know, someone who would actually deserve our respect as, as a solid structure. We just use it through. We just call this law thing, and we don't really need the rest of the object to uh, to anyhow to know about what's going on. So we just go through the class. We, we go through the object. We don't talk to the object, we just talk to the procedure which is inside the object. That's what's happening. And the name of the, of the class, encouraging us to do this, because we, uh, because we named the class not by, not by naming what it is. We gave the name, but what it does. So we just ask ourselves, okay, what this class, or actually a collection of procedures, what it does for us? It loads a file. Okay, it loads a file, then it's a loader, because it's the only thing it does for us. And, and then we call the loader, and then we understand it that this is actually a store, it's a, it's a storage place for the procedure. That's what's happening when we, when we give this name for the class. And it doesn't really matter, like look at these two lines, it doesn't really matter uh, how exactly, what, whether we actually encapsulate this path, or we just pass it as a parameter here. It doesn't really matter. In the first example, I did encapsulate the, 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 the path of the file. In the second example, I just pass it in a, as a parameter to the, to the load function. This looks more object-oriented. This one looks less object-oriented, because in this case, we encapsulate zero here. So the loader is absolutely not an object for us anymore. It's just, it's just a shell for the procedure code called load. That's, that's what we have, and that's what I'm strongly against. Uh, so let me let me reiterate it again. So naming the file, naming naming classes by er suffix by giving them names of of the by, by giving them the names by what they do for us instead of what they are is actually uh, is actually a, a, a bad practice because we encourage ourselves to think about this these classes these objects like like something which actually allow us to go through to touch the procedure to use the uh, the entity which is behind that and then return back the result. 
we don't care about this blue rectangle around the procedure. We just care about this procedure. We basically, like I said, go through. And that's what's wrong. That's what actually makes the whole uh, design wrong because we, we start thinking in a procedural way, in, in an imperative way, instead of object-oriented. Uh, let me show how it should be done in an object-oriented way, in the same example, in the same class loader. So let's go first to the code. Let me show you the, the code. I would, how I would rewrite uh, oh, I would rewrite the same class. So this is what we had. That's the loader. It just loads. It's a procedure which does it for us. And this is how I would do it for uh, in an in an object oriented way. So I would call it. I would create a class which will technically it looks very similar, very very similar, but it's conceptually it's not. So I would call it text file. So we have a class which is text file. It also encapsulates the location of the file. So it knows what file it is talking about. And then it has a function, a method, which is called content. So it's not a load anymore. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a content. It's a property. It's a behavior of the text file, which this class exposes. So we don't ask this file anymore to load something for us. We don't ask this object to load something for us. We just we just create it, and then we understand that this text file has a content. It doesn't load the content for us. It has a content for us. It's not a loader of a file anymore. It is a file. It is a file with a number of properties. One of the properties is the existing existence of content. So instead of making a loader, instead of making a, a procedure which loads the file, I made a file which actually is an abstraction of a real file on disk. And this abstraction has, for example, a property which is, well, has a behavior which is called uh, the, the existence, existence of content. Or it may have something else in the future, maybe an, a size of the file or length of the file or something else. So. You see the code. Let me show you the same diagram we saw before, and we'll compare what we have. So this is what we had, and this is what we have now. So now we have the rectangle. The blue rectangle is bigger, and and now the client, this which is my code, is calling the function. It's calling the method called content, which stays sort of on a border, which is which is an interface. It is an entry point, so we enter into the into the object. So we, we, we talk to the object through this through this content contract. It's like it's actually like a contract promise to us. Like the, the, the object says, I have a content. I'm an object, I'm a file, I'm a text file on disk. I am a text file on disk. I'm not I'm not doing anything for, I'm not loading files for you. I am a file. And I have content. And then when you ask me for the content, I do some load procedure inside, but that's my business. I know what to do. I know whether it's time to load the file or I don't load the file or I do something else. I'm not saying, I'm not promising you that I will load the file. I'm just saying that, yes, I have the content. I know where to find it. I know how to give it to you. I know how to present it in Unicode format. But don't ask me to load it because it's my business. Just, just, just ask me to give you the content. And then I go through this load procedure, which is which is the same, which is the same procedure, but inside the object, which is the same piece of instructions, piece of you know statements, operators, whatever, which manipulate with the with the disk. And this this method will definitely go through the same set of uh, instructions, and will definitely go to the disk and create the content and uh, decode it, convert it, whatever, return it back. And it's the same pass inside. But all this stuff is inside. And now the object is actually has this meat inside it. It's actually something which we respect. Because we don't go through the object. We just ask, we call the, the method content. And what happens inside, it's none of our business. And which, which, which is technically, you may say that technically it looks almost exactly the same. It does look the same technically but conceptually by naming because we're talking about naming here so by naming the class the right way we give the better we give a much better picture on a on the front side here on this side telling our clients who we are 
by naming us correctly. So instead of saying that, instead of giving the name of a lawyer to, to, to me as a class, uh, which actually a message to the client that I am actually a bunch of procedures or maybe one procedure, then I'm saying to the client that, you know what, I'm a text file. Whatever you want from a text file, you come talk to me. You want to know my content, you, talk to, you, you get this method. You want to know my length, I'll give another method for you. You want to know my something, I don't know, age of me, no problem. I'll give you another method which will, which will give you this information. But don't tell me how to get this information. Don't tell me to load it because it's my business. If I want to load it, I will load it. If I want to go to the disk and actually get this information, it's my business. Maybe I won't. Maybe I'll get this information from cash or somewhere else. This is how I manage my, 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 my uh, operations here on this level. But I don't expose this level to, to the external interface. I'm not saying that I load something. So it's, 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 we're talking now not only about the naming, uh, the way we name classes, but also how we name the methods as well. So <clears throat> we, shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't call our classes by, by the verb. And we also should, should not give these names like this load to the methods as well, which, which we expose. It's much, much better to say the content, which means I, re I give you the content, no matter, it doesn't matter for you how I get it. And this is how the code looks. So I just make an instance of text file, and then I say, give me the content. So this is an object-oriented way. This is how in OP it should look like. It shouldn't be loader.load, it should be textfile.content. And this actually encourages us to be more declarative, not just, not more, but be declarative instead of imperative. In imperative style, what, what's the difference between declarative and imperative? In declarative, in imperative style, uh, you give instructions to the computer one by one, and you expect this computer to execute them one by one. This is imperative. This is how languages like C, for example, work, or basic, or, or, or assembly. So you always understand that there is a CPU in front of you, the computer, the processor, and you have to tell the processor one by one, step by step, what to do and how to load the file. In this case, it's not really what the object-oriented programming is about. So this is imperative. This is how imperative looks like. So I'm saying, hey, I need a procedure which will be able to load a file from disk and i will tell you what the file is i don't care about you as an object don't give me this like object not object i just need a procedure which will do the job for me that's all i need and i create this procedure well i'm in java world i'm in object oriented programming so i have to wrap it somehow and that's why i create a class because i'm actually a c programmer i came from c so i don't care about your java object oriented stuff i just understand that to load a class to load a file from disk you need to do a few operations okay how do i wrap it how do i format it in your java syntax oh there you go i create a class i create a method inside cool the class is loaded this is imperative and this is wrong so c style of programming is c style of programming which is perfectly fine for c but for java for object oriented world it's different you don't say, you don't create, a, this, is, this is first we create a procedure, a holder of procedure, and then we call this procedure. And this is imperative. The declarative style is different. In declarative style, you declare a class, you declare that, hey, this is the object. This is the object. I don't know how it's gonna ha what's gonna happen inside. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know how it's gonna be loaded, or it's not gonna be loaded, or when it's gonna be loaded. I don't know when, when actually the CPU will be start, will started to be used. So I don't know when exactly the computer will start going to the disk and getting the content from there. All I know is that I have a text file and this text file is for me here and it behaves like, like a piece of text. So it is a piece of text. When I need it, I call the content and I'll get it. But I don't know when exactly the computer will start calculating and, and, and going to the disk and loading the content. So it's in my mind, I'm thinking declaratively. So I'm thinking like I declare stuff and I wire these objects together. And when they start to communicate, I don't know. And I don't care. I don't really know. I don't really need to know. I don't want to know. All I want to know is that, all I want to see is that my objects are, uh, my objects, represent entities from the real world. 
This object represents a file on disk. Another object represents something else on, on a SQL database. Another one represents a piece of data in memory. I just connect them together. I let them know about each other. And then I let them operate by themselves. I don't go one by one saying, load the file, get the content, store it there, keep it here, and, and, and print it over there. That would be procedural. That would be imperative, like in C, like we are doing in C. And, and in that case, I would be, that would be necessary for me to create like this, these procedures, which are load the content, save the content, print the content, uh, store in memory, recalculate, uh, summarize, do something else. So all these instructions I'm giving are actually, are actually we, we, we inherited them from procedural programming. So that is my point. So, so to summarize this, I would say that the, the better way is to, the right way is to call classes by what they are instead of what they do. So when you need to create and when you need to invent a name for a class, start thinking about what exactly is it? What are you trying to, to represent from a real world? If it's a file on disk, call your class file. If it's a text file on disk, call it text file. If it's a, uh, if it's a SQL database record, then call it a record. Don't call it retriever or fetcher. If it's a, if it's a web page, then don't call it a, a URL retriever or loader. Call it a web, a web page. Let me give an example from, from the article of these names we have. So if it's an encoder, for example, then you have an encoder which you say encode something for me. That is wrong. Instead, instead you should say encode text. So you want this text, you have the text which is not encoded, and then you need a text which is encoded. So you have, you have the text and you have encoded text. That's the right naming. Instead of saying I have a text and I have encoder, and then I say encode, I pass the text and I get the encoded text. That's wrong. So you say I have a text and I have encoded text. So you, you give the text and you wrap it into encoded text, and then you have, a then you have an object which, is, which behaves like an encoded text. It has a length, it can print itself, it can convert itself to bytes or something else. So decoder the same. You have encoded text, and then you wrap it into decoded text, and then you have a real text. So I mean, you, again, you have a class which is called decoded text. Not the decoder, but the coded text. The sorter. You can call it a sorter, like the sorter which sorts a list of something, or you can call it a sorted list, so which is a collection or list of something which is sorted. So you have a collection of strings, and then you create an object which encapsulates this collection of strings, and this object is called sorted strings. Not a sorter, not somebody who will sort these strings, because sorter is a place, it's a placeholder, is a like a holder for the procedure which sorts the collection. That's not right. It should be instead, it should be instead an object which behaves like a sorted collection of strings. That's why the right name is sorted collection or unsorted collection, or sorted from A to Z, or, or, or reverse sorted, whatever. But it has to be, it has to be a noun. It, ha it doesn't have to be a verb. It has to be a noun which says, I am a sorted collection of strings. I am an encoded text. Or for example, um, reader. We just discussed that reader, or loader, whatever, it's the same. So instead of calling it a reader, call it what it is. What, it's, it's a reader of a what, of a file? Call it Call it a file. But in Java, this reader and writer are two very famous concepts, and they are absolutely wrong. Uh, writer, the same for the writer. If you have a writer, instead, call it what is it exactly? If it's a writer which writes to the file or to the stream, then call it a writable stream or a writable file or, uh, uh, again, a, a text document or Unicode document. So something which you can operate with, you can write into. The validator, the same example. The validator is, you can call it uh, the validator, and then you say validate something for me, the number, for example. So you give it a, a number and you to make sure that actually this number is validated. Instead, create a class which will be called validated number. So you have a, just a number, and then you wrap it into validated number, which behaves like a number. But when you touch it, it says, hey, I'm not valid. 
So instead of making a validator and then and, and then passing some parameter into and say, hey, could you please validate for me this number, whether it's uh, in the in the in the given interval. So whether it's an allowed interval, less than 10 and more than zero, for example. That's very common, common practice. Everybody does like that. So you just validate new validator dot validate and then number and then the interval. That's wrong. Instead, you should say, my number and then new validated number and then you give the like in the constructor you specify the interface the, the interval and then that's it so you create a number and then you pass it and then you let it live you let it live its own life you let it communicate with other objects and when something happens to it it will throw an exception somewhere in the middle of his lifetime it will just say hey i'm for some reason i'm not validated i'm not in this given interval but it's not going to be a procedural way of validating. You're not going to ask anybody to validate my object. You will just create a new object which behaves like a normal object. But if something goes wrong, it throws an exception. And to do that, instead of every time thinking about what, what's the right design, I'm saying that if you stop using these ER names, if you start naming your classes by, by the verb and then the ER suffix, you will just you will just improve your design without any extra thinking. So instead of every time thinking, what's the right way to validate? Just just stop when you when you when you create a new class and you give it a name validator. Just stop and say, hey, there is something wrong. I'm not going to give this name to the class. The validator is a wrong name because of this er or or suff suffix at the end. So I'm doing something wrong. Just because of the suffix. Just because you give it. Just because the name ends with the er. That will be enough for you to, you know, to encourage you to, um, to force you uh, to change the way you think, to change the way you design uh, your classes. That's what I wanted to say. Um, I think that's it, probably. We just spent half an hour, and I will be able to answer the questions you may have. This is the, you can post them there. And while while you're posting, I can answer a few questions from the blog. So there were there were uh, a few questions asked on the blog, and uh, I'm going to answer them now. So the first one, the easy one, what about the OR suffix? Uh, it doesn't matter. The ER or OR, it just it just uh, the the English uh, the the difference in English naming is not a big difference. Just ER and OR is the same. Just stay away from this R in the end. Uh, but sometimes I have to say, sometimes some names uh, can be uh, acceptable. For example, programmer. If you're designing a system and you have to, you know, to, to to present the idea of a programmer who gets the salary, for example, then obviously you will use the name programmer. But that's that's a real entity from a real world uh, that that actually is a programmer. So it's not it's not like this rule definitely applies to all objects in object oriented world, but some names we just get them from the real world and they have this er in the real world for example computer or programmer or printer i mean the printer in the like a device so we it's okay to use them of course but all the rest just definitely no uh, uh one more question is uh i see your i see already the questions posted by you i have four a few more but Okay, let's let's go with this one. Uh, I'm gonna read it. It seems that you. Would, I'm answering this one. It seems that you would not like controller as an MVC pattern object. If true, should an object provide its own representation, in this case visual representation, or there should be a separate view object? Otherwise, we must use a controller. Your thoughts? That's a good question. That's a good question. I definitely, I'm definitely against the idea of this of the controller, and I think that the entire MVC pattern is kind of wrong. I mean, the way it's presented and with this view objects, and uh, so I, I, I'm planning to write about it in some time. But I have a feeling that the MVC pattern is not really object oriented. Because of the controller, first of all, but not only. Not only that. The only good thing is in the in the MVC pattern is the model, because the model is actually just an object model. It's just uh, the normal objects which we have everywhere. But this view and controller, they are kind of, I think, artificially, you know, 
um, they are not really natural to the object-oriented programming, and they are created mostly in order to overcome some difficulties with the user interface design. And the way it's done, I'm not sure. The MVC is actually it's not the it's not for the web. It was not originally for the web. It's for the user interface for the desktop applications. And uh, I'm not a big expert in, in desktop applications, but I think that um, that MVC pattern is is actually an anti-pattern. I would not be like really strong right now about it, but I will probably write something about that. So I would suggest to to try to always be as little as possible in this MVC. Sometimes it's not possible. You have you have frameworks and you have to, to use MVC, you have to create these controllers and you have you, you need these controllers to control what's going on. But I would I would suggest to name them for example for web I would suggest to name them uh, pages, for example. So instead of calling a controller, I would say it's a page. So I get a request from you, I give a response for you. So I'm not a controller, I'm a web page. I would call, I would give this name for the web. If it's a desktop, I would call it a screen. So why controller? Why, what's wrong with the screen? So the screen is like you give me something, you give your interactions, your actions, your events, and then I need to understand what to do, and I need to return back something. So I am a screen for you, which you interact with. Why should I be a controller? I don't want to control. I don't want to, you know, this is not the only thing I do. Again, this is not a, I don't want to be a, a collection of procedures. I want to be a screen which, which knows what to do, which knows how to react on events. So you give me the events, you give me what's going on, and I tell you what's going to happen next. I am the screen or I'm the web page. That's I think, would be a, a better name, screen or a page. I think so. Uh, one more question from, from the blog. Uh, someone asked me, uh, what, if I need, what if I need a bag of functions? That's a question. So I'm saying that uh, it's, it's wrong to create an object which is not an object but a bag of functions, just a shell for a collection of functions or procedures. But somebody is saying that, what if I need actually a collection of procedures? I don't want to be like, I don't want to create a real object, I just need a collection of procedures. And my answer is that if you, if, that, that if you need a collection of procedures, then something is wrong in your entire design that something is wrong on a bigger scale. So you, your entire application is probably done wrong if you need a collection of procedures. But it, that's, one, that's one answer. Another one is that uh, if you start using procedures and collection of procedures, then uh, you better go for static functions. Because if you, like in this example with the loader, you can encapsulate the, uh, the location of the file and then you call load function, which will you know use the encapsulated uh, property to load the file, or otherwise you can just create a utility class and put the number of functions there, put the number of procedures, and just uh, pass this location of the file into each of them and let them handle. Like Apache Commons is doing, for example, they have this file utils, and you can call file utils dot and then static function load file in text or whatever. But if you go, that will be just logical because if you need a collection of, of, of functions, a collection of procedures, then go for the utility class, which is totally wrong in the end because if you go for utility class, if you start using utility classes, then your entire code will be eventually become imperative and you will just have a lot of static methods everywhere. And then your entire design will be in a huge trouble. So you should stay away from static classes in the first place and, and, and making objects which are collections of, of procedures is very close to making them to using static functions. This, it, it's a little bit better than static functions because static functions is a completely wrong idea. You should just stay away from them at, 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 at all cost. Just don't use static functions. But, if you, but a little bit better way is an object which is a collection of, it's just actually an object like our, our loader. It's not a static, it's not a utility class, but it looks very close to it, very similar. So it's, it's as bad as utility classes, as, it, it's as bad. So my answer is that if you need a bag of, if you need just a class with a collection of procedures like load, save, load, start, I don't know, uh, get, set, then this is, 
then you're in trouble. And, and, and if you go this way, you will be in a bigger trouble quite soon. So that's what I would say to that question. Like if, if I need a, a bag of functions, don't do that. Um, a few more questions from the blog. Uh, that was a question someone said that, and if you go that way, like the way I just proposed, uh, we will have one class for each method, potentially. So we will have many micro small classes. Like for example, in this example, we have the, uh, the text file, and then we'll have the Unicode file, and then we will have uh, UTF-16 file, and then we'll have CSV file, and then we will have some binary file. So we will have multiple, many small micro classes, which are just classes and classes and classes for all different concepts we have in the application. Instead of having just one loader, and in the loader just say load UTF file, load binary file, load this type of file, load that file of file. So this looks more compact. Well, that's that's the question. So it looks like it's better to use it's better to have one file, one class, and multiple functions in the class, multiple methods, and then just and then just stay with that instead of creating for for every single method or maybe just a few methods a new class, and then just we'll have just i don't know hundreds of classes potentially and what about that and my answer is that will be great so if we have hundreds of classes and each class is just i don't know just 50 lines of code and just one function and just a few constructors that will be ideal object-oriented world that will be perfect if we have multiple classes and each class is small solid cohes cohesive and really decoupled from any other classes so I just, if I need this, I get that class. If I need that, I get that class. Look at the Apache Commons, for example, Apache Input Output Library. They have probably five or maybe up to 10 utility classes. And then they have in each utility classes, they have like 50 functions, 50 methods, maybe even more. Instead of that, would be great to have the similar library with 300 classes, 300 micro classes. Each class does its own work, does its own job. Each class is responsible for one small little thing. That will be ideal object-oriented library. So my answer is don't be afraid of small classes. They are good. The smaller your classes are, the better your software. The class ideally should look like you should see it in, in two pages maximum. And it, should, it, and it should have up to four public methods. That's the ideal size of a class. Many constructors, but up to four. Even four methods is kind of... On the edge preferably it should be one two methods maybe up to maybe three so the smaller the classes the better the design if you are as if you are so good architect so good designer that you can break down the problem into multiple smaller classes like a big amount of them without code duplication so you're not going to duplicate any lines of code be, uh, among them that will be a perfect architecture that's that's a sign of a like a sign of professional architecture in object-oriented world. A big amount a big amount of classes, small classes, really micro classes, each of them without any code duplication, each of them responsible for their own for their own task. That's how I understand object-oriented programming. So so to answer the question, what if we create in this approach a class for each method that would be perfect? One more question we have from one of you guys. So that's the question. Do service layer objects like file import service, validate file data, violate the principles you're discussing? Uh, yes, absolutely, definitely. So this whole idea of service layer is wrong, I think. Just, just the layer which we have services, and the service is something which I'm, I'm talking to the service, and the service is replying to me with some, uh, with some data. That's a completely procedural, completely wrong approach in the architecture. And that's what actually the RESTful API is against. So the service layer is what we had when we had SOAP and when we had RPC, which are not object-oriented at all. So we had this SOAP interfaces and we had this RPC remote procedure call. That's when we had service, service layers. And that was like 10 years ago. Now we have RESTful APIs, which are designed in an object, well, in, a, in the right way. I'm not saying it's object-oriented, because they don't, I don't think they declare it that way. But RESTful API, the RESTful design, is about making making uh, entities available in the network and accessible through HTTP. The same should be that we should we should actually transfer this paradigm to our software. So instead of saying 
like for example file import service so i say i have a service and i call it and say could you please for example convert the jpeg file to to gif file or convert me this format to that format or maybe store something somewhere so i'm i'm understand i understand that service layer is a collection of procedures for me and i can just go and find okay i need the procedure number two do something for me it does something and returns the result that's wrong it should be a collection of objects even though they are remote even though they're somewhere on another server on another machine on another network somewhere else like the restful api like the rest the idea of restful api each object is just a url and a collection of methods i mean the methods the http methods so i have the url for the for the i don't know for, for, for the user and i need to get the name of the user i just get the url and then the method is get so i'm calling the http get on this url and I get a JSON response. That's very close to object-oriented ID. And we have to just create this thing, call it an object in our, in our software, in Java, in Ruby, whatever, and then call it and say, give me your name. And this call will be transferred to the get call, to the get HTTP call, and we'll get the name. So the service layer is a completely wrong idea. Service layer objects, absolutely wrong. Just, just don't do it. It's, it's inherited from a long time ago. We had it like 15 years ago. Not anymore. Just don't do these service layers. It's just wrong. Okay. Question the next one. What about a common handler? Register user comment would be passed through a bus to a register user common handler. Um, register user comment, command. So what about the command handler? So that's a good question. Yes. Um, we have, I understand what you mean. So we have like, uh we have some some code which is supposed to handle the command we pass in so we have a command for example i don't know open a file for me or uh convert something or print something or something else and then we have a command a bunch of commands which understand what we say and then and then they receive that uh, i would not call them handlers the command is perfect the command is a perfect name because it's a noun. It's a, it's not a verb. It's not a command handler. It's it's something which is a command. So that's a perfect name. It's a perfect class. For example, I have a command uh, list and a command print. So I have two different commands. The first one lists file and the second one prints some file. And I'm, for example, a command line uh, tool which accepts uh, requests and does these operations. So the command is a perfect name for an object, a perfect idea for the class. But the handler, that's wrong. Because you don't need to handle commands. You just need to let the command to understand what, what to do. How to find the right command, you can create a class which is called commands. And then you, 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 you come to this class and you say, hey, how about you find the right command for this text? And the class, which is called commands, will find the right one and give it to you back. So instead of handler, just use commands, the S, the suffix S, which means many commands. So I'm not handling your commands. I'm not handling anything. I am just a collection of commands. You come to me, and I look like, a, like I'm, a big, I'm, I'm a big chunk of commands. And when you need something from me, I can find the right one for you. But not a handler. The handler is a, is a is a bad name because you basically you basically tell me that you, you tell everybody that this this object is expected to to handle something and that's it. So we there is some some handle procedure inside and this procedure will be called and will handle something and and that will be it. So like I like I mentioned before, that is wrong. So handler is wrong. Command is perfect. Uh, one more question: uh, When you use trimmed string instead of trimmer does not it reveal the job of the object trimmed string tells me that it's going to be trimmed uh, yes that's that's right and i think that's 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 perfectly correct that's what i want so i want my object to be named by by the way it look oh you mean that i'm when i'm saying trimmed string i'm saying what the what the object what job the object is doing it's it's trimming the string uh, that's true but i'm not saying how it's done i'm not saying that he's doing the job i'm just saying what's the result 
it's for example uh it's for example uh i'm uh coming to you and saying that uh uh let's say he's the man with the with apples so you're the man who has apples for me so i can probably get some apples from you or i i call you a man who grows apples so if i call you that you're a man who grows apples then this is this is i'm describing the job i'm describing what are you doing this is wrong but if i'm saying you're the man with the apples for me so i don't care how you got that apples where did you get them did you grow them or did you find them did you buy them i just know that you have apples for me the same for the trim stream so you are the trim string you are the string which is trimmed how it happened i don't care what job was done before i don't care whether you trimmed it yourself or you just get it from the library maybe you just found it on your in your hash map maybe you just found it from the like from the constant you know maybe you had it before maybe you didn't trim anything all i need to know is that what do you give to me what's your what's the contract so you the ob you're the object i'm the object and we talk by contract so your contract is to provide me the string which is trimmed how you do it i don't care but if I call, if, if there's a name as a trimmer, then you, you understand that the trimmer is completely wrong. Because the trimmer is like the man who grows apples. Or even, even worse, it's just, a, it's just a, there's somebody staying on the field and grows apples for me on the trees. That's what the trimmer name says, which is, which is too much, too wrong, and it actually just completely disrespect to you. Because you're not a man who stays on, the, on somewhere behind next to the tree and grows apples for me. No, you are somebody who has apples. I don't care how you got them. I I I, re, I I respect you enough to trust you to get that apple somehow. I'm not gonna tell you to go and grow them. I'm gonna just say, hey, give me the apples. I'll give you the money. It's a fair transaction. Instead of telling you, hey, go there, find the tree, grow the apples, and bring it back to me. That would be disrespectful, right? You would just say, hey, that's my business. I know how to do it. The same for the trim stream. The trim string is just saying, I have the string which is trim. Don't ask me how I did it. Don't tell me to trim the string. I'm not going to trim it for you. I just give it to you. So trim string is not, an, it's not a job description. It's still a name which, which is descriptive. One more question. What if you want to represent a real world object that ends with ER? Controller and manager are real world objects uh i like i said before we sometimes present control we sometimes present a real world object like computer for example or a processor or a programmer or i don't know their the driver taxi driver but the taxi driver is a name which is really a world a real world object which we just abstract in our in our software but controller well the controller if if the controller and manager you're talking about the manager in the uh, in the department the manager of the department or a controller of a factory like a real person uh, it's a real job title of somebody in the field somebody in the in the business then no problem of course you give this name so the manager we, if you're talking about for example i have programmers i have um i don't know uh designers i have testers and i have managers i have controllers and, and i'm talking about people i'm talking about people working there and no problem this er suffix is no problem at all but if i'm creating the manager inside the application which is managing other objects or i have to create a controller which controls a request a web request and then returns the web response then it's completely wrong then it's wrong because it shouldn't be a controller like i said it should be a page a screen a something which gets a, don't call me a controller. Don't don't call me. Uh, don't don't give me instructions. Don't disrespect me. Respect me enough to give me the title. To give me the name, the proper name. Don't call me a man who grows apples. Call me a man who has apples. The apple man. But not somebody who can go for you there and 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 do the job for you. I'm a controller. You give me the request. I'm supposed to control the request to handle it and give you back the response. Give me some respects. I know what to do by myself. Don't treat me like a like a like a request response person for you, like request response, you know, one time entity. You just create me, you, you you ask me to do some job, and then you throw me away. This is not what the objects are for. The object is a self-sufficient creature organism which is expecting you to talk to him 
like like you talk to 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 a human. The same here. When you when you give a name a controller, you give a name a manager, you basically completely remove the idea of 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 uh, making the object solid, cohesive, self-sufficient, like self self uh, good enough by itself. That's what I would say. I hope I answered your question. Uh, one more question: What if text file loads data asynchronously, so it needs a callback? How should we name this callback? Obviously, callback is a procedure, not an object. Uh, that's a good question. Thanks for that. Um, yes, sometimes we need. Uh, sometimes we have the situations when we have a procedure, uh, like callback, for example, or we have this listener partner or observer pat pattern. Um, when we uh, when we expect when we want to give a piece of code to someone. And then that someone has to call this piece of code when it when it's necessary. For example, a callback. Uh, it's not well, asynchronously. For example, how will we name that piece of code? Uh, I would say that uh, again, no er suffix because I don't want to be. I don't want to. It's. I don't want to be again. I don't want to to name this piece of code just a piece of code. Uh, in my code, I use the name target. So I'm coming to you and I'm saying, could you please do something with the file? And when the file is ready, hit the target. So this is the target for you. So you do something, and when you're ready, hit it here. And here means this is the target for you. So I use the name target, which I think logically is good enough for me. So again, you, you need a callback. You basically, basically what happens? What, what, what is happening? I'm, I'm, you're coming to me. And you're asking me to do something, and when I'm done, you want me to do something, to, to hit something, to call something, to, to actually throw some, some data to some to where? To the target. So, so okay, so point me there. So give me the target. You want me to shoot somewhere. So give me the target. So that's that's the name I would call. The goal, the target, the uh, the direction. But I think the target is the, the simplest name. Or a callback. You can say callback, but a callback is more like uh, I would I would not call it a callback because because callback is sounds like a verb. It sounds like you you actually expect this callback to just do something and that's it. But the target it could be anything. The target the the target itself could be a huge object doing something else, uh, making some important stuff, just expecting other calls, and it's still just a, and it's still just a target for me. So you come to me again. You come to me. You give me the directions what to do. You ask me to do something for you, and I do it. I just, for example, get the file or something, and and then when it's done, I, I hit the target which you pointed to, which you pointed me to. That's what I think. Okay, one more question, and we are done. Um, and that's the question is. Uh, Someone asked me why not just use functional programming if I think that each object has to be that small and each object, each class has to be like a few functions and each class has to be as small as possible doing just one thing and it has to be named by the what it is instead of what it does, then it's very close to functional programming. So why not just you know forget the Java, forget object-oriented programming and just go to functional programming? I think that even though functional programming is quite close to object-oriented programming, still OOP is more powerful and more expressive because it has classes, uh, objects, and functions, and methods, while functional programming has uh, functions only. There are some functional programming languages which also have classes, of course, but I consider them more like you know, object-oriented programming plus functions. So if we're just talking about pure functional programming, just functions, and I think this language is, this, this approach is less uh, powerful, re less uh, expressive, and uh, mm, is not as you know, convenient for us humans to think of. So functional is more for, I think, well, for more mathematical tasks and more for low-level programming. Object orienting is easier to understand, easier to start working with, working with easier to, uh, to understand the concepts, because an object is an object. I have an object in the real world, and I can abstract this, this cup 
uh, in an object in an object in an OOP quite easily quite easily in functional programming what is a cup it's just I, I need to build a number of functions which will be able to uh, to do something with the cup but I can't represent the cup itself as far as I understand functional programming so even though they're close even though object-oriented programming is close to functional programming I, I think that object-oriented is object-oriented it's 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 more powerful, more interesting, more. Uh, if we do it the right way, if we stay away from these classes, which are not really classes, if we stay away from these uh, collections of procedures, which are just uh, which are just uh, you know staying there waiting for our instructions instead of living in the in the world of of of, of other objects and interacting between each other. So we should, to summarize, I'm finishing. So to summarize, we should stay away from dumb objects which are uh, really uh, you know, transparent and just shells for procedures. We should create objects that do not allow anyone to tell them what to do, but they expose behavior. They just bring something to the world. They just follow, they just obey some contracts, some interfaces. They give something to other objects, but they don't let anyone to tell them what to do. They don't tell them, nobody can tell me what to load the file, but anyone can ask me to give the content of the file back. So that's a different. Maybe it sounds, maybe it sounds grammatical to you, but it's not. It's really conceptual. So start, start thinking in objects and not procedures, and you will change the way your code looks. That's it from me today. See you next time every month on the first Wednesday at 11 a.m. by San Francisco time. Thank you. Bye-bye.